Hello and welcome to this last lecture on post-colonial literature. Uh, now, as the past 19 lectures must have conveyed to you, the spirit of post-colonial studies has always been strongly informed by the desire to critique, question and to dismantle whatever is established, whatever is regarded as the mainstream, whatever is regarded as the hegemonic. Now, it is almost 40 years since the publication of Edward Said's pioneering text, Orientalism. It was first published, if you remember, in 1978. And in these uh, four decades, the field of post-colonial studies, which Said's text brought about into being, itself has become part of the academic establishment. And uh, today, to a large extent, it shapes the mainstream uh, discourse within humanities. So, in this lecture, I will try to apply the spirit of critical dismantling that informs post-colonial studies to the field of post-colonial studies itself. And uh, by doing so, I will try and find out if we are led to a new theoretical ground, a new critical ground, if we manage to earn a new perspective. Now, as you might have noticed, the title of this lecture is Postcolonial Futures. But according to some critics of postcolonial studies, this field has no future at all. Indeed, this death of postcolonial studies has been announced by no less a figure than Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, who is regarded as one of the holy trinity uh, in the field of postcolonial studies. And uh, Spivak, in 2013, for instance, has relegated postcolonialism to the past. To quote her, I think postcolonial, this is Spivak, I think postcolonial is the day before yesterday. So, she was clearly trying to distance herself from post-colonialism, with which her name is now synonymous with. Yet, even after being renounced by Spivak, the term post-colonial keeps regularly appearing in the titles of academic journals, monographs, and university courses, including uh, this course, our course, which is titled Postcolonial Literature, and this is 2017. So, and Spivak was announcing the death of postcolonialism in 2013. In fact, the book from which I borrowed Spivak's quotation is Anya Lumba's famous introduction to the field of postcolonial studies titled Colonialism slash Postcolonialism. And this book went into its third edition in 2015, just within 17 years of its publication. And such continuing demand for introductory manuals and academic courses on post-colonial literary studies show that the field is clearly far from being dead and done with. One might even argue that with each such announcement of the demise of postcolonialism, the field has only become stronger, and each announcement of the death of postcolonialism has led to a greater profusion of studies bearing the title postcolonialism. So, why is it that in spite of frequently being declared dead, postcolonial studies continue to remain a strong presence within the academia? Well, announcements of uh, the death of postcolonial studies are actually informed by deep-seated doubts and questions regarding what are considered by the criticizing voices as the basic premises of this academic field. Yet these questions and doubts, rather than making postcolonial studies irrelevant, merely help it or has helped it so far to mutate 
into newer forms. In fact, post-colonial studies has not died precisely because of this incredible capacity to mutate that it has shown so far. And this has of course been uh, helped by the vagueness that uh, surrounds almost every term associated uh, with this field of postcolonial studies. Now, in all my past lectures, I have tried to remove this vagueness that surrounds various terms associated with postcolonialism, so that you can have a more clear perspective as a student. But in this lecture, I would try and foreground some of that vagueness which I had deliberately left out or which I had deliberately tried removing in my earlier lectures. And I will do this because I think to understand the probable futures of postcolonial studies, we need to know something about the transformative possibilities that these zones of vagueness hold out. So, let us start our inquiry with the term postcolonialism itself. If you go back to the initial lectures uh, in this series, where I uh, was trying to define the term postcolonialism for you, you will see that I had uh, limited the meaning of the term postcolonialism, or rather the term colonialism in a particular way and I had limited the meaning of the term colonialism to take into account only that form of colonialism which was initiated by certain European countries since the 16th century and I had limited the meaning of the term to only take into account that form of colonialism which is driven by the profit making imperatives of capitalism. Now, if colonialism is to be defined as the forceful occupation of the land and resources of one group of people by another, then such activities uh, has been going on in the human history from time immemorial. And uh, therefore, um, to have the 16th century as a cutoff date for colonialism is ultimately arbitrary. But in my initial uh, set of lectures, I had in fact alerted you to this arbitrariness. What I had not alerted you to is the other way in which I was limiting the use of the term colonialism. And I am going to talk about this other arbitrary way in which I have limited the use of the term colonialism during this course, but I have not spoken about it so far. So, this is. Uh, something like letting the cat out of the bag. Now, even if we chronologically limit our understanding of colonialism to being a post 16th century phenomenon, you will realize that this period has witnessed different kinds of colonialism by different European countries. Thus, for instance, the 16th century Spanish colonialism of Peru was markedly different from the 18th century British colonialism of India, which in turn was again very different from the 20th century Italian colonialism of Ethiopia. Yet, as you will know, in this course, whenever we have referred to colonialism, we have disregarded this variety and have implicitly understood colonialism to mean just British colonialism of places like the Indian subcontinent, Africa and the Caribbean islands. Now, such vague and indeed biased use of the term colonialism has been integral not only to these lectures that I have delivered, but it has been integral indeed to the field of post-colonial studies itself. Um, and this in spite of the fact that Edward Said in his Orientalism had spoken uh, extensively about uh, the context of French colonialism and um, the French colonial discourse. Now, in their introduction to the book, 
uh, titled Francophone Postcolonial Studies, which was published in 2014. Uh, the editors Charles Fosdick and David Murphy notes this Anglophone bias and mentions it as a very factor which has led them to highlight the French or Francophone aspects of postcolonialism. Now, this is indeed a major piece of criticism leveled against the vague and biased understanding of the term colonialism within the field of postcolonial studies. But this criticism has not made postcolonialism redundant. So, in spite of the criticism that postcolonialism doesn't have a clue about the complexity of colonialism, about the complexity and variety of uh, the different uh, kinds of European colonialism that existed from say between 1500 to 1950. The field of postcolonialism even today has not become redundant. Indeed, the field has merely transformed itself to now include various kinds of postcolonialism. So, when uh, we talk about postcolonialism today, uh, we talk not just of Anglophone postcolonial studies, but we simultaneously talk about Francophone postcolonial studies, for instance, or Lusophone postcolonial studies. And these different um, sort of threads of postcolonial studies focus on the different kinds of colonial experiences and colonial legacies that various European colonial powers um, uh, had subjected to the uh, different parts of the world that they colonized. And indeed, um, as you can see, the term post-colonial features very prominently in the title of Charles Fosdick and David Murphy's book itself, which uh, criticizes the existing field of post-colonial studies. So, as Charles Fosdick and David Murphy uh, writes that they have deliberately chosen not to do away with the field of post-colonial studies, but to merely introduce the angle of francophony to that field. Now, the vagueness surrounding the use of the term colonialism has also another aspect to it. By limiting the use of the term colonialism to mean only British colonialism, we have not really been able to focus on how colonialism is active even today, in spite of the fact that the British Raj, for instance, uh, has uh, died as a political entity long ago. Now, here I am, when I am saying that colonialism is still alive today, I am uh, thinking of neocolonial powers like America, for instance, uh, which uh, continue to subjugate vast parts of the world by economic as well as military means. Uh, Upamunno Pablo Mukherjee, in his book titled Postcolonial Environments, which was originally published in 2010, draws our attention to this continuation of colonialism uh, when he says that, and I quote from the book, the post in postcolonial marks not an end of colonialism, but an end of a peculiar mode of colonialism which then shifts its gears and evolves to another stage, obviously triggering a concomitant shift in the global struggles against it. Here again, Mukherjee, by moving on to study the impact of this new form of colonialism on human and non-human aspects of the environment, is not killing off the older form of post-colonial studies which uh, primarily focused on the discourse analysis of the European colonizers and the texts of resistance emerging from the parts of the world once colonized by Europe. Rather, Mukherjee's intervention merely transforms the field of postcolonial studies by expanding its ambit. Indeed, Mukherjee identifies himself not as an anti-postcolonial critic, but rather as a critic who represents what he calls the second wave of postcolonial studies. Moving on to another problematic area, which the critics of postcolonial studies regularly point out, and this area, uh, this problem area, is uh, that 
is, is a way in which this uh, field of postcolonial studies constructs the Occident and the Orient as belligerent opposites. Now, such a worldview which looks at the Occident and the Orient as perpetually engaged in, uh, in a relationship of belligerence, in a relationship of fighting opposition, uh, is, uh, you will agree, a rather simplistic understanding of the complex colonial reality. So, not all Indians, for instance, opposed the European colonial rule and nor did all Europeans support the project of colonial subjugation. A desire to recognize and address this issue has again opened new research areas within the field of post-colonial studies, thereby transforming and expanding this field in new ways. For instance, new research has highlighted how sections of the subjugated population, uh, including sections of middle class nationalists, collaborated with the European colonizers to uphold and sustain the colonial rule. And here, for instance, I am thinking of a figure like Bonkim Chandra Chattopadhyay. And uh, if you remember our discussion of Bonkim Chandra Chattopadhyay, you will remember how we discussed him both as a figure who um, pioneered the discourse of uh, middle class nationalism and also uh, a supporter of uh, British rule in India. So, even though dismantling, but no, before I, I'm, I want to make another point here. So, on the one hand, we have critics who have highlighted this collaboration between subjugated Indians and the colonizers to uh, sustain the colonial rule. On the other hand, uh, scholars like Leela Gandhi, for instance, uh, in her book, Affective uh, Communities, uh, has uh, foregrounded how some Europeans collaborated with colonized subjects to form a united front against colonial rule. So, in some cases, we see colonized subjects collaborating with the European colonial masters to perpetuate the colonial rule. In other cases, we see how some Europeans have collaborated with uh, the colonized subjects in uh, parts of the colonized world like India to fight the colonial rule. So, even though dismantling Eurocentrism still remains one of the central agendas of various post-colonial scholars, the field of post-colonial study has gradually moved away from conceiving the relationship between the Occident and the Orient merely in terms of antagonism. And it has now become more aware of the various networks of connection that held together and indeed still holds together the subjugator and the subjugated within the frame of colonialism. Now, finally, uh, I would like to end this lecture by commenting on the role of intellectual as conceived within this field of post-colonial studies. Because here again, we encounter a certain degree of vagueness which has opened up the field of post-colonial studies to adverse criticism. Now, post-colonial studies, again, this you will know if you have been listening carefully to our lectures, emerged as a field of inquiry within the English departments, the English literature departments. And this has meant that post-colonial studies had initially concerned itself with literary criticism, primarily with literary criticism and with discourse analysis. However, if we look at the career of Edward Said, the founding father of post-colonial studies, we see that he was not only a literary critic, but also a person who believed in engaging more directly uh, in political action. Indeed, one of the uh, more remarkable photographs that we have of Edward Said uh, shows him throwing a stone at an Israeli guardhouse to protest what he saw as Israel's hostile occupation of Palestinian land. Uh, 
uh, and today Said is as much uh, remembered as an activist as he is remembered as a literary critic. However, as uh, Graham Hagen uh, notes in his survey of the state of postcolonial studies in the introduction to his 2008 book titled Interdisciplinary Measures, Literature and the Future of Postcolonial Studies, the value of literature has consistently gone down within this field while more active intervention has come to the foreground. And we have seen examples of such active intervention by post-colonial scholars. Uh, when we discussed Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak's work as a teacher among uh, the landless villages of West Bengal, for instance. But more recently, this has resulted in attempts by post-colonial scholars to rethink the value of literature vis-a-vis -vis their sociopolitical activism. Hagan's own book, Interdisciplinary Measures, provides precisely such an attempt to make an argument for the value of literature in conceiving ethical action. To quote Hagen, literature is a vital tool in what the Kenyan writer Ngugi Wathiongo calls decolonization of the mind. In the continuing struggle to create new possibilities of thinking as well as living, for previously exploited and dispossessed peoples, literature plays a formative role. So literature, the study of literature remains invaluable or uh, critics are discovering, uh, rediscovering its value, if you will, uh, to understand ethical action, to understand uh, how to uh, guide the action um, of exploited and dispossessed people. Now, since we have mentioned Spivak as an example of a post-colonial critic who is also known for her activism, it is worth noting here that Spivak's latest book titled Aesthetic Education in an Era of Globalization, which was published in 2012, also makes a very strong case for literature and literary imagination as a basis for ethical action. Um, so this reimagining of literature, of the value of literature, of the value of literary imagination and how literature can train um, our ethical responses to various crises um, also presents itself as one of the many directions towards which post-colonial studies might move uh, towards in the future. And with this, we come to an end of our course on post-colonial literature. I hope you have enjoyed listening to the lectures. And more importantly, I hope this course has been able to help you look at literature as well as the world around you, uh, which bears indelible marks of colonialism in a whole new light. Thank you for being us through these lectures. Goodbye.